I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. The right to have rights is a phrase refugee and activist Hannah Arendt first used in a 1949 article and again in the 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Our guest today, Stephanie de Goyer, is co-author of The Right to Have Rights. She told The New Yorker's Masha Gessen, the refugee crisis after World War II revealed to Arendt that humans can exist in a place called nowhere. They can be displaced from political community. They can be turned into abstractions. De Goyer is professor of English at Willamette University, where she focuses on the intersection of law, politics, and aesthetics, and just recently was appointed fellow at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University. Stephanie, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on this book, which is timely. You were saying to me that you actually conceived of it prior mm -hmm. to the rise of, of Trump and Trumpism, mm -hmm. although the machinations of Brexit and mm -hmm. the contemporary politics were certainly in the development. Um, how do you apply this idea of a right to have rights mm -hmm. in this contemporary moment? How, how do you conceive of it today? Well, when Arendt, Hannah Arendt, wrote the phrase, the right to have rights, it was in the context of a chapter where she was diagnosing the problem of statelessness in the interwar and post-war period. And until our own refugee crisis currently, that was the biggest refugee crisis the world had faced. And so in some senses, there's a parallel that we could draw between our own moment um, of severe crisis millions upon millions of refugees seeking for um, some sort of sanctuary or refuge to her own time when she was seeing this happen in Europe. So I think that would be the immediate context. And what was her aspiration in, in her writings that you and Masha Gessen and others have brought back to contemporary relevance today? What was the aspiration in terms of establishing for humanity that idea that human beings, whether they are of a state, mm -hmm. born with citizenship, mm -hmm. or born without stated explicit citizenship, they as human beings have certain, to quote Jefferson, inalienable rights. Arendt was critiquing this idea of the inalienable rights at a time when human rights were just becoming an idea, beginning of the United Nations post-war period. She was doing so at a time when it wasn't popular or uh, to suggest that there wasn't such a thing as human rights or natural rights or what she would have called the rights of man, which Jefferson would have been referring to. Her critique has to do with the idea that when you're your, at your most human is when you're at your most vulnerable. So if you're a stateless refugee who's been cast out of your only country of origin and nobody will receive you, what good is being human, she asked. Um, if being human marks you as your most vulnerable, uh, what kind of right is a human right? And I think that was the kind of critique that she was bringing to the surface at a time when people still tended to think that there was something inalienable about rights. And did she have a prescription in terms of how we ought to see um, immigrants or migrants or those who were denied their basic humanity? Did she, did she have any solutions that we could think beyond the critique? That's the great question. And I think that question energizes our entire project. Um, we have different, there's four authors. We had different opinions. I would say that myself and Samuel Moyne have been spoken of as the most cynical. I think Masha Gessen refers to us as uh, less hopeful, if only because Arendt seems to suggest that if you have lost this right, you cannot regain it anywhere unless you are made a citizen of a country. And so she doesn't propose a solution beyond the idea of giving somebody refuge as a citizen. You, in these essays, mm -hmm develop through that phrase, the, mm -hmm. the right to have rights. Can you tell our viewers who are interested in this subject mm -hmm. how you tried to dissect mm -hmm. word by word this expression? 
Yes, it was, it's probably the most exciting project I've been involved in as an intellectual professor. We took the phrase, the right to have rights, which has been read by so many people, philosophers, activists, um, historians, and we, we wanted to really get at the heart of its paradox, which is that in order to have the right to have rights, you have to be a citizen. So what we decided to do is to divide it up. I took the first right of the phrase, the right, mm -hmm. which is often seen as a moral or uh, universal foundation. Lita Maxwell took the verb to have. I mean, what does it mean to have rights? And she, she ran with that. Samuel Moyne took the pluralized idea of rights and asked, what are these rights given that we know that Arendt was so critical of social and economic rights, or at least she ignored them. And then um, Alistair Hunt took the implied subject, which is there is none, right? Is it an animal, is it a human? And he spoke of that. So it was by dividing up the phrase into chapters that I think we kind of um, uh, emerged with a really rigorous analysis of it that and we couldn't have done alone. Was there ultimately amongst yourselves a consensus in terms of the preservation of rights-based democracy at this moment in our history? I don't know that we, we didn't have disagreements. I would say that we had different shades of hope. Mm -hmm. I think that Lita Maxwell thinks that the right to have rights is a phrase that summons this idea that we can demand rights, that we can have them by concerted political action, which I tend to agree with outside of Arendtian's view, Arendt's view. But my, my chapter really proposed that Arendt in her time, 1951, she was looking to America to be the hope. And given what we know of where America is going right now with um, its use of the refugee crisis as a kind of weapon of domestic politics, I'm not so sure that I have the same kind of hope that emerges elsewhere in the book. Well, that's why I wanted to have you here because mm -hmm. in our politics today, mm -hmm. whether it's an issue like healthcare or domestic tranquility, mm -hmm. the idea of securing rights is really the origin story of, of our democracy and the mm -hmm. literature that mm -hmm. accompanies it. And so what can you share with us in terms of the efficacy of that argument um, mm -hmm. that healthcare is a right, peace in your community is a, is a right? Uh, that is a kind of language mm -hmm. in political messaging um, that is being employed. How can it be better employed through the literature, uh, whether it's the Parkland students who are saying mm -hmm. we have a right to uh, not be murdered in mm -hmm. our school, or it's the people, the beneficiaries of uh, the patients in the SNAP program mm -hmm. who are seeing their medical care mm -hmm. challenged and most likely revoked their right to health care. How do you think about a rent informing our politics today? I think Arendt, there's many possible answers to this question. The right to have rights, she is thinking singularly of citizenship rights. And she sort of argues that citizenship is the right you need. And once you have that, you can have rights. But she doesn't really go into social economic rights, a right to health care. And in the book, I talk about this example of in Detroit, where residents of the city filed a lawsuit against the city who had turned off their water, saying they had a right to have water. And the judge in the case responded, well, water is necessary for life. It's not enforceable. It's not a, a, a right you can have. And so these residents applied to the United Nations. And the United Nations can come in to America and shame the city. But unless the state decides to turn on the water and hear that argument, the utility of that right. So rights do depend on shaming, making a, a public display. 
but there's no guarantee they'll work. And I think that that's the message I would say, is that rights are more important than ever, but they're not guaranteed. You can't rest on them. You have to fight for them. Right, and that citizenship, mm -hmm. your native Canada, mm -hmm. so healthcare is a, is a part, mm -hmm. a vital part yeah. of your citizenship, whereas in the United States, mm -hmm. even in the aftermath of the Affordable Care Act, we haven't really reconceived intellectually or live now differently than we did pre-affordable care. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that argument of fully materializing your citizenship through rights um, one that you see playing out differently in Canada uh, than you see in the United States or elsewhere? Uh, I do want to embellish on this in the context of the refugee crisis, but I really think there's a, an element of your book that is important to our domestic politics right now. I, I, I think you're right, and I think I would sound at this particular juncture, this is one of the problems with Arendt's thinking, is that she wasn't thinking about domestic politics or social economic rights. Uh, she thought those were the rights of private citizens and they didn't interest her. But they interest us, especially more than ever. And I think we could talk about Black Lives Matter, for example, talk about citizens not having the equality of their rights as other citizens, or so-called a second-class citizenship. Uh, I think we could talk about that. I don't know that a rent can help us figure out a domestic right to health care as a private citizen or, or person, uh, a Canadian. I, I know the lived reality, the differences of some countries. But could you imagine a world in which an American moves to Canada and declares a right to health care? Um, not really, although maybe rhetorically you could. What would you say in the current American environment mm -hmm. are those rights within citizenship? I think 2016 American election, origins of totalitarianism, Arendt's 1951 you know, three volume epic work becomes important to everybody again. But where we really push its significance is in this crucial chapter about citizenship because Arendt was witnessing in America in the 60s efforts to denationalize citizens and efforts to denaturalize, naturalize citizens. Now that stopped around 1967. But there was recently a Supreme Court case that luckily shot down a lower court's um, ruling that an ethnic Serb woman could be denationalized because she lied on her application about her husband's involvement in the Bosnian army. That would trouble Arendt. That was the kind of thing she worried about, the loss of citizenship. I mean, can you imagine a world where you can lose your own place in it? And I think we should be really worrying about that. When we think of how to grapple with the rights of, of those um, who are homeless, stateless today, mm -hmm. compared to during the, the Holocaust and World War II era, what's the difference today that you wanted to kind of most starkly point out to, to readers? The difference is a scale. Um, there is, I think, many more refugees today. The access points are no longer Europe specifically. Um, we have other countries that are receiving them. America, though, since 1980, has a Refugee Act that allows it to have a certain quota that, to receive refugees it can receive more in a time of crisis. Obama lifted the cap right. to 100,000 and now we're back down to 45,000. So I think America's role in the refugee crisis is interesting in that it seems posed to be taking in far fewer refugees right now than other countries like Sweden and Canada. How do you see rights and citizenship in the context of the, the recent North Korea mm -hmm. hostage situation where, as we speak, there are efforts to bring home um, right. Americans. And it struck me that your book and Arendt's 
idea of citizenship might be useful to think about and why today we're thinking about the American hostages in North Korea differently from the American hostages in Iran and the valuation of citizenship from one country to the other. It might be totally haphazard and it might be the president's allegiance to this new kind of tribal mm -hmm. alliance between Russia, Israel, Saudi uh, influence versus Iran. But I just wondered, how, you know, mm -hmm. is there a reason that we're in effect, or at least this government is saying that hostages in Iran are not as important as hostages in North Korea? I think the answer to that is that it's the politicization of citizenship. Arendt has this phrase in Origins of Totalitarianism that a refugee with a name is better than, a, than one with none, more or less. That to be a famous cause, that's one of the only ways of kind of receiving refuge is to sort of make yourself famous. Not that these hostages are making themselves famous like celebrities, but this is a situation in which we're politicizing their case. Um, and so it's unequal for others. It's stunning to me the degree that uh, Donald Trump and company, mm -hmm. Secretary of State Pompeo now, mm -hmm. have normalized the North Korea regime yeah. uh, at, relative to Iran where there actually is internet, mm -hmm. although it's suppressed and mm -hmm. under government surveillance. There's no internet and there has mm -hmm. been no internet in North Korea. Mm -hmm. There's news and literacy and actually the, the beginnings, the origins mm -hmm. of citizenship in Iran, whereas they're not even remnants yeah. in North Korea. It, how, how, how does Arendt see the stages evolving of um, freedom, citizenship? Uh, how do you assess the, where those two countries are and how the American involvement in those two countries influences the state of citizenship internationally? I don't know that, well, A, I don't think I can answer it through her thinking yeah. um, personally. Yeah. If only because it's, it's, it's the political whims of some leaders. Arendt wanted us to realize this, that we don't have universal rights. Universal rights would mean that everybody receives them equally. But we know, for example, that refugees, when they seek asylum in America, there's gross disparities between when they're received with a yes and when they're received with a no. It depends on what country they're from. There's, you know, Syrians right now are uh, looked upon as unwelcome refugees by the administration. So it, it's really about arbitrary political interest mm -hmm. that determines the so-called right, right to have right. a right. I mean. Well, that's what I wanted to revive in the minutes we have remaining, this mm -hmm. question of solutions and how Arendt's literature and, and the contemporary environment can, can illuminate where we are, where we might be able to go. So in terms of solutions, <clears throat> that's a big question and it's not an easy one. I think pragmatically we need to raise the, the quotas on how many uh, newcomers we allow into our country. I think we also need to reassess this idea of nativism and, and, and that birth determines your citizenship. That's what my next book's about. I mean, this idea of being naturally born is such a fraught concept. And so I think if we can rethink the relationship of birth to place, to country, we can extend that anal analysis to look at um, undoc undocumented persons in this country. People who have been here, who are a part of this country, who give to it, and who make it a community. And so I think being able to see the borders of our community differently are going to be vital for answering this. Those are sh somewhat short-term solutions yeah. insofar as what you get at in terms of the cultural acceptance and tolerance, that, mm -hmm. that's a longer term exactly. effort. But I want to just poke at this a little bit more mm -hmm. because without, you know, as, as, you, as you say in, 
the, your, your second chapter to have. Um, this political conception of rights offers less moral security and solace than a conception of rights mm -hmm. as natural possessions. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a consequence of political achievements mm -hmm. that either realize or don't realize those objectives. And so we're in this discourse of Trump, this mm -hmm. where immigrants and refugees are maligned, if not explicitly, indirectly. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's a place to um, renew a call, as Yasha Monk has mm -hmm. in his new book, for a an inclusive nationalism against a bigoted nativism. Mm -hmm. um, there have been these moments, whether it was the Declaration of Independence or the UN mm -hmm. um, Declaration of Human Rights, Universal Rights, um, that have aspired to really accelerate mm -hmm. the pace of rights-based citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now we're at a place where the discourse in Russia and Turkey and here mm -hmm. have all collapsed, even the ambitions to achieve a point at which people have those universal rights. Domestic politics since the 18th century, we could go back to England, which is a period I study, always likes the scapegoat of the foreigner to achieve its own power. And I think the real blindness here is a failure to act in the interest of the world, in the interest of the country, for a short-term receipt of uh, power. So I think or I'd, I'd like to see leadership that recognizes that there will be some people in America uncomfortable receiving newcomers, but understands all that they bring to the country in terms of economics, sure, but also just in terms of making our country great, to readapt a phrase from somewhere else. But I, I, I come out pretty cynical in the book in that I don't think there's a quick fix. Yeah. I, just, I just don't. But I do know that people like Donald Trump, and there have been many more like him in history, will continually use the foreigner to advance their own power. And that's something we need to pay attention to. And is that the source of your cynicism? Most that the historical records suggest that this is not an anomaly. This is a... How do you get somebody to care about someone they don't know? Adam Smith talks about this in the theory of moral sentiments. How do you, how do you create a welcoming posture for people that seem to threaten you? I mean, that's the challenge. And I think leadership can be one way of uh, addressing it. I think the United Nations, I think shaming, I think. You mentioned shaming mm -hmm. and guilting. I, I mean, that's what norms do, international norms. You, you, you can't take them to court all the time. Right, right. And can you be desensitized mm -hmm. to the point of a complacement that has you mm -hmm unable to be guilted or be shamed. I mean, isn't that what, what we've I think reached? that's the fear. I mean, history will judge this moment the way that we judge the way America turned around that boat full of 900 Jewish refugees. Right. And history will judge us. And one of the reasons that I gather Democrats are, at least this generation of Democrats mm -hmm. do not invoke Roosevelt is because mm -hmm. of Roosevelt's historically mm. reported role in not acting soon enough. Exactly. Not acting until we were attacked. Um, are there examples of the, that kind of moral leadership that you would like to inspire our audience with at, at the conclusion of this? An example of moral leadership. That, that flummoxes your cynicism, that gives us hope that I think is... some of the protests at the airport mm -hmm. that we saw last right. year, right. I think 
all of the activism being put together and by undocumented persons in this country is incredibly inspiring. Um, if there is a right to have rights being enacted, it's there by people that have no power and are enacting it anyways. That's where I would find it. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.